Hello and welcome to another episode of Horn of Africa TV. Discussion today will be focusing on the current political situation in Ethiopia, the Horn of Africa and beyond with my guest, Professor Mohammed Hassan. I am Elias Amare. Uh, Professor Mohammed Hassan is originally from the Somali region of Ethiopia. He's knowledgeable on Ethiopian, Eritrea and Somali issues. He currently lives in uh, Belgium and is affiliated with the Belgian uh, Workers' Party. So, Professor Mohammed Hassan, welcome. And can you please uh, say something by way of introduction before we start our discussion? Thank you, Comrade uh, Elias Amara. Uh, my name is Mohammed Hassan, born in Addis Ababa, uh, lived uh, most of my life in exile. I have been one time a former diplomat of Ethiopia, a member of uh, the Labour Party. Uh, I live in Belgium uh, and I work in Belgium. Uh, this Very is well. Uh, you have also written extensively over the past decades on, on the region, especially uh, Ethiopia, the conflict between Ethiopia and Eritrea. You have traveled to Eritrea and interviewed uh, uh, the president of Eritrea, uh, President Isaiah Saforki, with your comrades from uh, the Belgian investigation group like Michel Colon. Uh, also, you are uh, an advisor to the president of the Somali regional state of Ethiopia, Mr. Uh, Mustafa Omar, correct? That is correct, yes, indeed. Okay, so let us then begin with the situation in the uh, Somali region. Uh, how is it now? Uh, is, is the situation stabilizing there after all the turmoil, the the, the brutal human rights situation there that uh, the Somali region has been experiencing in the past two, three decades under the TPLF regime. It seems the situation is turning for the better now. Uh, can you tell us uh, more about what is happening on the ground there? Well, uh, uh, this region had passed for almost seven decades in a very difficult situation. Uh, in the last uh, two decades, it had been the most horrible situation happened to the population. The killing was extreme, the raping of the women, the elimination of the youth. A huge number of the population have left the country and became refugees in Kenya. Uh, the struggle of the region against the center had been continuous, and the region had been a military base for a very long time. Now, since two years, when Mustafa Umar took over uh, the administration there, uh, uh, peace is prevailed. Most of the population, uh, because they have suffered extremely and understood the meaning of peace, their first priority is that to rebuild and to maintain the peace. Comparatively mm -hmm. from other regions, it is the most peaceful region. People are coming back to rebuild their homes and to think what to do in the future. There is no serious contradiction, despite that other forces very far from the region tried to destabilize the region, but they didn't succeed. Uh, Mustafa Omar, with his ability and with the young educated group who are leading the region, they are trying all their best. And I could say that it is the most peaceful region. And of course, the development must come slowly and uh, there is a lack of fund. There is a, a total crisis in the country in general, but the region is saved from internal conflict and it is the most peaceful region of Ethiopia today. That is good to hear. Um, I've been following Mr. Uh, Mustafa Omar. He's a young, uh, capable leader and very impressive indeed. I agree with you on that. Uh, how is the situation uh, with, the, uh, with the ONLF, the Ogaden National Liberation Front, which, has si which had signed a peace agreement and is now back in the region? Uh, how are they managing the transition? 
It is a, it's a very good question. Uh, comparatively from other regions, that it is our region, the Somali region, have received it is sons and daughters who had struggled against the previous regime. Uh, 800 combatants, they flew directly from Asmara and they came home. Probably they will be integrated into the national uh, security to help the peace uh, and the development of the region. The relationship between the ONLF and the administration, it is in speaking term and even more than speaking term. This week, uh, uh, they have uh, came together and they gathered uh, and they discussed about uh, the peace uh, prevailing in the region. They are, uh, in fact, the ONLF also, to a certain extent, it is uh, cleverly managing the peace and understanding that it is the relationship between the administration and the party must be very smooth. And the last two years, we didn't have any type of conflict among the Somalis, except uh, a small skirmishes between the pastoralist uh, uh, element uh, who are sometimes having contradiction of theirs. But politically, I think it is the ONLF and the administration, they are in speaking term, they are not in an antagonistic contradiction, and there is no conflict. In fact, it should have been a model for all other regions. The mm -hmm. speaking term in a sense that it is, these are our brothers and sisters, they have struggled at one time, they have sacrificed a lot and so on. We don't see them as, a, as an, an enemy army or enemy party. They have their own vision and the way they are thinking, but they are part of the, the greater Somali family. And uh, the president of the region also handles them in that case. And uh, it's not only uh, they are in speaking term, they are in fact uh, comrades as far as uh, peace concerned. And uh, I expected that other regions could adapt to this type of uh, relationship and thinking, but it's unfortunate it didn't happen. But the Somali region is today is the most peaceful one. And uh, the both the, the party or the ONLF as an organization and the ruling party and the administration, they are now in a speaking term. And from the beginning, they didn't go into contradictions. That is, mm -hmm. we find it very, clever move from both sides. Uh, I'm happy to hear that uh, this is a, 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 a new hope uh, for Ethiopia, I suppose, uh, an example to follow for the rest of the regions. Uh, I recently watched on Ethiopian television uh, two documentary films on the horrible uh, atrocities and uh, gross human rights violations that happened there during the previous regime the uh, under uh, uh, of course Abdi Lay who is currently in prison and the TPLF uh, regime and uh, the military there uh, on jail Ugaden and uh, the overall uh, massive uh, crimes uh, that were perpetrated on the Somali people. Is there a serious effort now underway to document all those uh, atrocities and uh, the crimes uh, against humanity and to bring those who are responsible for these crimes uh, to justice? Could you say that there is a serious effort underway? that the rest of Ethiopia could follow? First of all, uh, uh, one has to understand the crime committed in the Somali region from the bigger framework of Ethiopia itself. It's the regime which is which, which controlling the whole Ethiopia have committed this crime, not specifically only in the Somali region, but also on all Ethiopia. The understanding in the beginning was that it is uh, uh, this uh, uh, TPLF uh, group, when they left at, at the Sabiba, they were in a very panicking situation. And we hoped that it is all these documents will be released and all Egyptian people 
will know about the atrocities and so on. And probably uh, uh, we could have created a special prosecutor office with the documents and so on and indict these criminals. But this is, didn't happen even in the center. Now it is even forgotten. Normally, when there is a change, and there is a change where the majority of the population have struggled and brought a change, immediately the caretaker government should have done the first thing in order to bring peace and reconciliation among the Ethiopian people is to answer this problem. But it didn't happen because it was uh, for other objectives uh, which I disagree, but for other objectives that have been a political of appeasement against the TPLF was put in. And now the TPLF, not only political of appeasement, it became even very strong and in trying to create and, and apply it is a, a strategy of chaos. Of course, the Somali region it have uh, very meager resources in order to analyze without the support of the center. Most of the crime is committed by Ethiopian troops and the Ethiopian generals who have been stationed there. Most of the looting and the raping it is made and subsidized by this element. And this was no discussion was made. It's not only even in the Ethiopian army it didn't make a committee to analyze and to study what happened and to indict the criminals. It didn't happen. But the population was hoping that there would be a sort of a trial that it is the family of the victim could be convinced that this was not happening. We in the region, we try to speak about it. Sometimes the president also speaks about it. The people are coming and informing the, the, the legal department what happened to them. But in the center, I think it is there is no such uh, thing happened. It's not only the Somalis who have suffered, also the Oromo and other people. And I think it is one of the biggest mistakes the country in its transition made. Normally, it is uh, under transition. The first thing is you try to bring to prevail justice in the country. All those people who have been attacked, killed, jailed, all the properties who have been stolen from the Ethiopian people and so and so on. It is almost more than two years and so on. There is no discussion about it. There is no debate about it. There is no even uh, 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 a special commission which analyzes all these crimes of the previous regime. And uh, finally, all these documents, probably they are evaporated or disappeared. But it is uh, the TPLF now is breathing a new oxygen and even threatening to, to attack and saying that it is they are fighting for the right of self-determination today while they are killing all Ethiopian people and looting this. It is unfortunate uh, that it is the government of Ethiopia didn't take it as a serious project but for several reasons, I will say. First of all, this project could have unified the whole Ethiopian people, including the people of Sudan, to show the magnitude of the crime committed by this group. But this was not done, and it is unfortunate and historically was a mistake. We will come to that, uh, but before we proceed to the larger, uh, bigger Ethiopian, bigger picture of the Ethiopian situation, uh, let us stay on the Somali region. Uh, groups like uh, Genocide Watch and I believe other human rights uh, watch groups uh, have charged that during the reign of the TPLF regime, genocide did indeed happen in in uh, in the Somali region in uh, what is uh, known or called as Ogaden. Uh, to put uh, figures, how many people, uh, the, the, in your estimation, were the victims of? Uh, uh, how many died and how many were jailed and uh, the displaced people that went into? Uh, refugee camps in Kenya, like the Dadaab refugee camps. Uh, give us some some uh, figures uh, about the estimate, this. Uh, the estimate of uh, di different NGOs and medias, they estimate more than one million uh, uh, inhabitants of the region have left and they went to the refugee camps in Kenya. I estimate even more than that because it is only they are estimating one 
refugee camp that they have went also all over the world. This is one. Second is uh, some estimates say that the killing level or the the killing uh, level they estimate about seventy thousand people, but I think even more. The the raping is is they estimate probably more than thirty to forty thousand. And there are uh, uh, areas that it is uh, uh, was not considered as as uh, it was a killing field area, which was very far away uh, from the international community, and the army have closed that area exclusively, and uh, nobody knows that the number of the pastoralists who have been uh, shot and killed in these areas. So, in order to know all this, I think it is two major variables have to come openly into the surface. First of all is that it is the monitoring group of the Ethiopian army itself, because the Ethiopian army have been stationed extensively there with their own supporters. It's uh, the, the not supporters, so they created a sort of, a, of a low intensity war. They closed the whole area for uh, uh, no NGOs is allowed, no media is allowed and so on. And particularly after the Chinese uh, uh, engineers who are digging, working on the gas, they were killed, that it is the whole area was closed totally. And of course, the international community was observing it. In fact, uh, in this situation, that it is the British Development Corporation have subsidized uh, more than two, uh, 20 million euro to train this uh, low intensity uh, war and, and the fighters who are Somali speakers brought in into Somali area in Hurso. The made, special forces you're talking special about. Forces I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. it, is, uh, 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 it was supported in the name of development. More than 20 million pounds was subsidized and even British officers came and trained these special forces. Uh, the other point is that it is uh, Billy Gates, the statement itself it tells that it is, we have to bring these people into globalization. Globalization, according to him, is that these people, they refuse to be globalized. They were refused to be civilized. So they have to be punished, to punish and brought in into the globalization thinking. The main purpose is there is there is not the population. It had always been since uh, the Emperor Haile Selassie's visit uh, for the first time in 1956, and later on turning the whole region a military, ba a military basis and so on. His, his, his ideology was we want the land and not the people. There was a problem. What, are, what resources are available there? That, there, uh, there, there since, 1990, uh, since 1929, an, an, an American oil company have discovered oil there, Sinclair. Uh, hmm. It is the same company, which later on this became Conoco and later on Chevron. These are, uh, uh, by 1929, they discovered oil. By 1940, they have written a very long letter to the US President uh, Roosevelt asking that the region have a very big resources and this region, it is better to be attached to our friend Abyssinia. By that moment, it's not Ethiopia, Abyssinia. And gradually this region, 1948, it's one part of the region which called how the reserve the area was given to Ethiopia. And the other part, which is in 1954, which is called Ogaden was given to Ethiopia. So the Emperor Haile Selassie, he could visit that region uh, for the first time in 1956. For the region, it had been seen always a conflict uh, area, and it is uh, the third, the fourth uh, uh, division, I mean, the the third division of Ethiopian army. So it was stationed in Harar and in this Somali area. And uh, before it was an apartheid situation, there is only one road. On the left side, it is the Somalis are living. On the right side is the army and the army families are living there. So it is a military occupation. Uh, the same situation continued also under the TPLF. The TPLF wanted to give a project to the Chinese as far as gas uh, uh, concern and oil. And so when the ONLF have attacked and killed several of them, then they closed the region and they committed atrocities against the Somali people. Of course, uh, uh, most of the information, most of the, the movement of the troops, who are the commanders on the ground, 
what happened. We could not even make an interview with the officers and the soldiers who have participated or who have been an eyewitness on these atrocities. No, the center have not responded. And the center, uh, I assumed that the center will have created a commission to study all the atrocities in the country, but unfortunately, this didn't happen. This is the situation mm -hmm. that we so managed to do. Okay. Uh, so now let us switch gears and uh, move to the center and to the bigger picture of Ethiopia. It's been uh, over two years since the reformist government of Prime Minister uh, Dr. Abiy Ahmed came to power. Uh, and the, the former uh, rulers, uh, the TPLF, then fled to their uh, uh, northern uh, base uh, or region of Tigray. How has the overall the transition been managed, in your opinion? Uh, uh, what are uh, the good uh, achievements, the positive sides, and uh, what still remains to be done? How, how is the security situation there now uh, on the ground? What we hear of late is that uh, there is growing instability and in ethnic conflicts, uh, maybe in Oromia, uh, but elsewhere also. So give, give us a sense of uh, the bigger picture of what is happening uh, has been happening in Ethiopia over the past uh, two years? Well, uh, when uh, uh, the change uh, came and Dr. Abiy became prime minister, the view of uh, the international community on one side, the view of all Ethiopians on the other side, was a very big hope. Hope in the sense that it is, first of all, peace will prevail. Peace will prevail in a sense that not only to Ethiopia, but also peace will prevail in the region. And the project I thought it will be peace with our neighbors and peace with ourselves. Uh, the first step is the prime minister have taken a step and he went to Europea, he signed the peace agreement, which was uh, appreciated by the international community, by the majority of the people of the Horn of Africa. And as, as, a, as a result of that, uh, he was also became a Nobel Prize winner. But that should have been also translated in the country. Peace is a project for, for the country and for the region. He started the peace to make peace in the region. Automatically, he should have started also to make Ethiopia peaceful. And to make Ethiopia peaceful, you need to take several steps and to be very bold. One is that it is as being an Oromo himself, uh, Dr. Abi, and knowing that there is also different political parties in Oromia, he should have made a very long discussion with them and come with them with a minimum program. That I call it the internal peace process and then also deal with other Ethiopians, despite of their different ideas and outlook, and come with an umbrella agreement with Ethiopian peace and Ethiopian plan. So peace for the region and peace for the country. This is the first thing, if I will be in his place, I will do. And simultaneously, they are interconnected and dialectically, they are interconnected. We want peace in the region. We want peace with Eritrea. We want peace with Somalia. We want peace with everybody. But at the same time, we must have a regional understanding of peace and internal understanding of peace. And to do that, as I have said, that it is the political actors, the Oromo political actors must come uh, around the table and take even a very long time and discuss among themselves very frankly, openly, and so on, and bring a minimum program, a peace for Oromos and peace for Ethiopia. This didn't happen. Unfortunately, it was in the shortest period, this situation went into a difficult, a deadlock situation. And that's why now the country is in a very difficult situation. This is the way I understand. 
in order. Mm -hmm. If I may, uh, in order to help us uh, understand the, the importance of uh, Roma and the Oromia region, uh, as you know, the Ethiopian scholar John Merkakis uh, wrote the book uh, Ethiopia, The Last Two Frontiers in 2011. And in one uh, Oromia studies, Oromo Studies Association conference where he was invited as a keynote speaker back in 2015, I believe, uh, here in the United States, uh, uh, Howard University in Washington, D.C., he said to the gathered uh, scholars, Oromo scholars, that uh, the Oromo uh, have to decide what they want. Do they want in, inside the Ethiopian state, or do they want out? Uh, but he said, once you, the Oromo make up their mind and decide, then the future of Ethiopia will be decided. To what extent do you think uh, this is true? And, uh, what is preventing uh, the Oromo from uniting and, and deciding? Uh, because it seems to me that uh, the Oromo question in Ethiopia right now is the central question, politically speaking. Am I correct in assuming that? That's true, yes. Uh, I think uh, uh, when I speak uh, and analyze as an external uh, uh, Buddy, John Markakis' book was published in 2011. Mm -hmm. uh, when this book was published, I was in Asmara. And uh, when I went back to Belgium, I ordered the book and, and I read it thoroughly. I was impressed in the sense that this man had 45 years experience in studying on Ethiopia. And this book of him, it seems that it, it is his last book on Ethiopia and he made three things, fundamental questions clearly. The book was published 2011. By that moment, Nandez Zainari was alive. And he said that it is the regime of TPLF is over. There is no hope for TPA. Yeah, he said the die is cast the for the regime. Yes. Hmm. I was surprised that the political forces in Ethiopia who were at that time who are struggling, why they didn't understand that? If they had understood and read that properly, which is means that it is the time of the regime, which is very limited, they could have developed a confidence building among themselves. They could have created a discussion among themselves if the die is cast, and we don't know when it's going to collapse, which is means is the regime is at the end of the tunnel. Any political party will envisage that it is Ethiopia is in the process of a change. And if it is that Ethiopia is in the process of a change, how can we support this change and how can we bring the stability and fraternity among the Ethiopians? This is the task of the political forces. But unfortunately, the political forces, they are not sophisticated enough to understand what Professor Mercatus was saying. This is the dilemma of the country. They could have agreed and made a very long discussion among themselves, within their supporters, within their market, and even beyond Ethiopia and in, in Ethiopia. Then when they go back home, when the situation comes, they could have a very clear roadmap how to deal with the problem in the country. They were ill prepared themselves. Suddenly they went on home without any program what, what kind of Ethiopia they want. That is first of all pillar number one. A political mm -hmm. party who cannot analyze beyond it is not, have no strategy, a long strategy and tactic who cannot read thoroughly. There is no study group within their parties. They couldn't understand why Professor Markakis have said this. They could have debated with him, brought him for a debate, and all Ethiopians could have debated and prepared themselves. A revolution is a way of, a change is in a way of that woman when she's giving a delivery for a child. And a delivery is known, the process of it. 
the time of the, the, the pregnancy it is known. It cannot be 12 months, 13 months. It could be in a very limited. This is scientifically known. But unfortunately, these political parties, they were very, very weak. And one of the disasters of the crisis, which caused now the recent problems in the country, because of lack of that. Second, they could not mobilize the diaspora population. So if there is a change in the horizon, then the diaspora population should have discussed and you should have no confidence building, uh, knowing each other. Everybody came from different home, different language, different psychological makeup and so on. They could come into a minimum understanding what new Ethiopia we will be. They didn't do that. If you don't do your homework, somebody will do for your homework. They didn't do. They failed on that. The political forces who are not under the control of, of PPLA, who are outside. Second, mm -hmm. PPLA itself didn't read also the process. Mele Zenawi, their ideologue, he was alive. They thought it maybe John Marcatus, he was laughing, he was kidding, it's a joke. But they didn't analyze socio-economic, psychological situation of the country. The man was living five years in that country. He was researching, he is meeting different people, different type of, 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 of political forces in the country. And he came to conclusion that this PP have to cross these two lines in order to survive. What mm. his, his conclusion was, is that it's possible that Ethiopia can build a democratic federal state. And he divided Ethiopia into two highlands. The old, well, the higher highland, which means Amhara, Tigre, Ago area, the old Abyssinia, and the southern highland, which is, is Oromia and the southern areas and so on. He said there is a sort of an integration, a minimum integration. Maybe there is no complete integration because of uh, the lack of economical development of the country. The majority of the population is still in the peasantry and rural. They don't know each other. Urbanization is very, very limited in that country and so on. Here, despite of all this, there is a possibility of building one federal democratic Ethiopia. So he gave his opinion. One can disagree, can agree, can debate about it. This debate didn't happen. And uh, mm -hmm. unfortunately, it put the level of consciousness of the population very low because a leadership, a political party, which raises the consciousness of the population, consciousness is not something you buy it in the market. Consciousness, you don't get it through uh, 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 genetic. It comes from outside. As the French, they say, if you don't like politics, politics likes you. Therefore, it is they will come to your home, the politicians, the political parties, whatever, even if you refuse politics, but will come to your home. And they should have trained their own people. They should have de developed a fraternal relationship among themselves. They have only one country. But what happened mm -hmm. is that once they went back, there was no infrastructure. And those who, are, who came out also from inside and those who came back from outside, they could not read each other. Their reading became very, very poor. And that's why I think the crisis reached to this level. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're going to talk about uh, the inter-Oromo uh, situation, but before we do that, I'd like you to address the, the issue of uh, one ethnic federalism of the TPLF that, that the TPLF put in place. Was it real federalism or not? And two, uh, the two major pillars of uh, Ethiopia, ethnically speaking, by uh, population size and uh, what have you, are the Oromo and the Amhara. Uh, talk, if you will, about the Oromara alliance that brought down the TPLF regime. And why is that in trouble now? Uh, why could not that continue after, you know, after the, the reform government uh, came to power? Very good. What is the contradiction between the Oromo and Amhara? Is there a, a contradiction? Very good. First of all, uh, the federal system, normally federalism is good for minorities rather than majorities. Minorities who demand in most of cases to protect themselves and to protect their own market against 
a bigger thing. Second one has to be made very clear. Federalism as a philosophy, as a, as a, for, as, as a system of state, have its own logic in different areas. If you take the federal system of the Swiss, it's based on cantons. And the, the cantons are 400 cantons in, German, in Switzerland, and 70% of the population speak German. It's not based on languages. Why it happened this in, the, in, in Switzerland? Switzerland had a specific historical process. What does it mean? The Swiss, they were mountainous people. When the Roman Empire was ruling, and there was no even national army by that moment, and the Romans, when they went to go to the Gaul, Gaul means it's France, there is no highway, there is no plain, there is nothing. They cross the shortest way is through the mountain of Switzerland. So what happened when these gladiators, they are passing, they rape the women in Switzerland, they loot the property of the people, and so on, they reach France, they loot also there, and when they come back this. Finally, the local population has to defend itself. So they organized self-supportive defense mechanism. And that is the canton. One canton, you can have three people who speak three languages, unified to protect their families, and so on. And from that perspective, the Swiss were seen by the Roman civilization as a brave fighters. Once the Roman civilization collapsed and a new history with the Rome taking over Christianity, as you see now when you go to Rome and you see visit the Vatican, the soldiers who are protecting the Vatican are Swiss soldiers, were considered very brave and fighters and so on. But they are not special from the others, but they were protecting themselves. They were suffering from these Roman garrisons who are passing through there. So the, the solidarity, the concept, the survival within the Swiss remained. That language is not, there is canton who speak three languages and so on and so on. Finally, with the capitalist development, that it is, there was almost 400 independent cantons. If I am a factory owner in France and I produce shoes and I wanted to send these this shoes to, to Italy, I will not pass via uh, Switzerland because each canton will ask me a tax. I have to pay 400 tax to reach to Italy. My shoes will be the most expensive shoes and nobody will buy me and my factory will close. So most of business and, and industrialists avoided Switzerland. So Swiss became a problem. That is why federal state came. Federalism is a process of integration that the federal state will put one taxation not 400 taxation and so on. In this way, that the federalism under the capitalist system came in Switzerland. Second, the parliament in Switzerland and Bern, they speak in French. The French speaking uh, population is only 20%. Nobody feels that it is dominated by the French language and so on. The level of the democratization, except for the women in Switzerland, the level of democratization was very high. Only women that is only 1960s that Swiss women could vote. To come to Ethiopia, there is a nationality problem since the student movement. This is an empire. There is no difference from the Habsburg Empire or Tsarist Russian Empire or the Turkish Empire. The, mo the more modernization and education uh, reached under the, the Haile Selassie's regime, the first concept of enlightenment reached the country. And one of it is the national situation which have been discussed by different student movement and so on and so on and so on. You know, I will not go deep on that. Finally, after 1970s and the collapse of multinational parties and the domination of the military because they are the only one who are organized, ethno-nationalist movement developed in Ethiopia. That is 73 OLF, 75 TPLA. Finally, the, the the, the military regime created a, an, an, an commission to study the nationality issue. There was on the basis of a commissioner. People, they put a budget, they brought all 
intellectuals and educated people from economists, ethnologists, anthropologists, name it, even philosophers and so on, to use language as a factor and to know how the population is living. So most of the studies of the Kellen, it's not made by TPLF, it is made by the, the, the military regime, the Dirt. When TPLF took over the power and wanted to monopolize the power, and it created a an, 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 an transitional government. The two partners, the EPRDF, so-called EPRDF and OLF, they are the major designer of the transitional government. In that transitional government, they have decided that Ethiopia will be a federal state, Kalil, and they have used the 14th map of, uh, of uh, the military regime, and this Kalil was put in uh, uh, to the public, and then immediately when the regional election came, the TPLF got frightened, and it has created its own organization, a protege, that uh, uh, the OPDO, and it wanted to use the OPDO and impose on the Oromo people. The OLF was chased away from the power. Now here, the OLF achieved two fundamental things. One, for the first time, the different provinces for example, Oromo who live in different provinces, for the first time they have been united in one Oromia. That is a plus point that the OLF have succeeded. Second, Oromo was an oral society, and it transformed that oral society into written society, Kube, Latin was taken, and now most of the youth in Oromo, they read uh, their own language and they write their own language. This is but TPLF, so a sort of nationalism developed out of this. Developed. It developed and it reaches to this level. The TPLF was thinking in terms that it is to divide and rule by putting all this group into their cages and they can sit in the, at the top. The main strategy of TPLF was what they call them is a fire and 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 and, 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 and grass that the two nationalities, the major two nationalities, there is a major contradiction among them, too, Oromos and Amharas, and this, they cannot look at each other uh, 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 and they don't like each other, so we can sit on the top and we can rule this country. That is their project. Divide and rule, that is. Divide and rule. But the two, these are central for them. Central is that if you want to stay in the center, you need to have to appease the Oromo issue, and at the same time, in order to control the Oromos also and to control the Amharas, you have to use this technique of divide and rule, particularly between the Amhara and the Oromos, and then finally rule the whole country in this basis. And that is what TPLF did for the last 27 years. And finally, it melted down its aspirin by the popular revolt. And now it went home, it is integral. And so so the is, alliance that was formed uh, between the Oromo and the Amhara, did, did you think it lasted uh, post the, the reform uh, government or is it now in trouble? Is that part of the problem? The alliance came from a popular forces mm -hmm. and uh, it didn't come from a political groups. The alliance is that it is a reflex of the struggle of an as a result of an anti-TPLF. But it didn't develop what will happen after TPLF is demise. How we are going to reorganize the new home. How we are going to build a new Ethiopia. There was no discussion. Of course, there could not be discussion. As I have said, outside also, the political parties who are outside, they never- In exile, you mean? In exile. Then they didn't make also a discussion among themselves. So nobody knew, everybody was in the dark. And uh, there was no, in fact, effective, clever political organization who have seen that we are starting a new era. And in this new era, we have to build a new basis and our relationship must be in our new basis. It was a spontaneous revolt of the Oromo people and the Amhara people. This brought them to ally against the main enemy. But what after that, it was not clear and it was not studied, discussed, continued until today. And that's why that conflict again come back. That concept which the TPLF was thinking that it is the Amhara and Oromo will not agree, it's come back again in an ugly form. 
and it break mm -hmm. also the situation. That is. Uh, now, as you mentioned earlier, the prime minister himself is, or he hails from the Oromo uh, nation, the Oromo ethnic group. Uh, but within Oromia also, there are several parties, uh, the, o, the oldest being the OLF, the Oromo Liberation Front, that was in exile, uh, based in Eritrea and elsewhere. And they have uh, si they signed the peace agreement to, to come back, to return to, to their homeland and enter peaceful political struggle. Uh, so what is happening there? Uh, w w what is the conflict there about? I mean, it seems that uh, there is an uh, inter, uh, you know, in, in, within the Oromo, the, there seem to be conflict. Is there a sectarian conflict? Uh, why cannot, why can't they all, uh, you know, unite uh, to, to lead the transition, uh, to rally behind the prime minister, for example? What is dividing them is my question. Yeah, that's a good question. First of all, inside the country, uh, a new element developed is called the Abi of the Lama group, Abi Lama group. This from inside. And mm -hmm. they were members of OPDO, which is means that the OPDO, despite being a creation of the TPLA, you can create uh, uh, an organization for a specific purpose as a colonial force or as a dominating force, but you are dealing with human beings. And through the evolution within this Oromo organization, there is an angle that it is, their property is looted, they are dominated by minority, and so on and so on. Oromo nationalism gradually as it developed outside in exile, it is in another part of Oromia itself, but also within this organization gradually was developing. And the TPLF knew that. The TPLF, that's why it brought what self-criticism and criticism is a mechanism to control and to purge the element who are questioning the hegemony of TPLF. But TPLF is a minority organization very far from its center, 850 kilometers. And it is living inside the center and beyond the center, tries to control and dominate politically, militarily, economically, and psychologically. And their human resources also is very thin. You cannot dominate beyond your capacity. Tigray, it doesn't have a lot of intellectuals where they are specialists of every ethnic group and they can study and so and so on. Their whole theory of them was based on the property of the, in, the, uh, 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 the studies which is made for the emperor in the time of emperor, a little bit the studies made by the military regime. So Tigray was in constant contradictions and always conflict among themselves. In this sense that it is every day when they wake up, they say, okay, we are surviving today. We don't know how we'll survive tomorrow. So in this way, daily they control, daily they try to manage through intelligence and surveillance. And you cannot rule a country only by these two tools. Psychologically, you have to dominate them, which is, you don't know how you can measure that. People can keep quiet, they can withdraw, they can distance, and so on and so on. It doesn't mean because they withdraw and they keep distance from you, they are afraid of you or they are not cooperating with you, or they cooperate with you and they make sabotage with you, TPLF had a very serious problem. Because of that, it created 100,000 member intelligence service. That is the only organ with controls. So what happened? Security and intelligence, Security yes. Security and intelligence. Mm. This is always colonialists and minorities always look for such kind of a solution. Then what happened is, Within the OPDO also, according, in fact, it is now he made it very openly, the president of Oromia. He said that it is in 2009, eh, there was a serious debate within OPDO, says, before the election. And he said that first, uh, before 2009, 2005, 2004, element of the leadership, they wanted to assert their independence from TPLF, they were crushed. 
Then in 2009, there was a debate, and in this debate, there was three lines was brought into the table. One who is thinking that we have to wait, it is the time is not right, and we have to take an evolutionary situation. It was rejected by the majority. This is according to him. The second is who want a revolutionary situation. Let us make a revolution and so and so on. This idea also was rejected because the revolution will bring a lot of damage, even though it will succeed and so and so on. So they said, which is probably the reformist, he says we are the reformist, probably also Lama is reformist, probably Abi also later on he became part of this reformist. We the reformist, for the first time without the knowledge of TPLF, we organized an election and we elected our leadership. This leadership is no more directly under the control and TPLF was very angry on us, but they cannot do anything. That is what you, explained. you are talking here about the, the leaked uh, speech indeed, of the indeed. president of indeed. Oromia, Shemalis Abdisa. Indeed. This, this indeed. talk he gave to Oromo yes. elite, I suppose, yeah. seven months ago. Indeed. So it is, when I analyze that, it, it, it sounds uh, logical in the way he was analyzing it. Secondly, is that uh, to come to your question, the relationship among the Oromo organization, whether it is in diaspora or those who are inside, despite of the same sentiment and same understanding, which is platonic understanding, they have never developed a working relationship, a very strong working relationship among themselves. So their cadres and rank and file, they don't know each other very well. And they have, there is no debate among themselves what are the minimum programs how we will continue from, from now on, and how when we go home, how we will deal also with the political forces inside and, and, and so on. The prime minister is supposed to be, that to be an arbiter in this sense, bring all the political forces, or more political forces, have an honest and frank discussion. Discussion not only in the halls, but involving the majority of Oromo people and come with a minimum program this is our agreement, and we can continue on this and deal with the other people and go to the election that was possible. It was not done. What happened is that within one year time, situation, the relationship between Lama and Dr. Abi became very bad, as, uh, as I was told, and it continued like that, and finally it reaches to this level. It is unfortunate. The Oromos had a historical chance to rebuild, to rebuild, and a strong relationship among themselves, and a strong relationship with all the Egyptian people, and a strong relationship with the region, and be a vanguard of peace for Ethiopia and for the region in general. But that historical chance, I, I think it is uh, uh, now, it is not uh, uh, in the moment. Uh, I hope that they will come to their senses, but situation, it is very, very bad now. I hope that the Prime Minister will understand and all the actors will understand. The country, now there is more than 10,000 Oromos are in prison. The contradiction between among inter-Oromo became very, very difficult. The, uh, I hope that uh, they will come to their sense and discuss and resolve their internal contradiction. This is what I have to say. And going beyond uh, Oromia, also in the southern region, there are uh, uh, growing uh, demands for uh, self-determination, sort of, uh, for, uh, for recognition as uh, Kilins. Uh, the Sidama uh, region has been recognized now, a referendum was conducted. Others, other ethnic groups are also demanding, like the Walaita, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, what do you, what do you foresee, or how, what do you think the, the future holds for uh, the other ethnic region, uh, ethnic groups that were lumped into this big uh, southern uh, people's uh, region? I think uh, uh, before I touch there, it is the major problem or the major mistake was made is, as I have said. Peace for Ethiopia and peace for the region. That's a very good step. The peace agreement between Eritrea and Ethiopia, it is Prime Minister Abiy, he was brave and he did it. And the Eritrean leadership, they were brave and they have signed. 
and that problem is at least behind us. But peace in Ethiopia, that was not war. Peace in Ethiopia can only be built in two kinds. One, identifying the criminal, the one who brought Ethiopia to this situation, and this criminal band must be psychologically, whether in the future, must be banned as an organization and must be brought to court. So what- You're talking about the TPLF. The TPLF. What unifies uh -huh. all the Ethiopian people huh, as a common agenda and anger of the Ethiopian people, including the Tigrayan people, is to show the crime of TPLF to the Ethiopian people in the international community which is means you could have created a commission, commission one which is reporting and studying on the basis of the document existence in the country, commission which explains to the people the type of the crimes it is committed, it is committed everywhere the crimes, that it is, will unify also from the ground that it is the unity of the people who have suffered under this leadership and, and under this terrible, uh, 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 regime that uh, it was not there, which is wrong. When the TPLF came to power, it have created a special prosecutor office led by Girma Wagdira as a minister level. They have imported a special investigator, which later on became a chairman, a judge here in the Hague, uh, the new uh, 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 court, huh? mm -hmm. the uh, Alcambo from Argentina. So we should have brought and exposed this crime against humanity committed in Ethiopia. Nobody spoke about it. They looted the treasury of the country and brought the country into a serious economic crisis. Nobody spoke about it. This brought division because there is no discussion. On the contrary, they went back to their home, they reorganized their thing, and they became very strong today, and they are threatening you. That was mistake number one. Second, there must have been a commission of peace, a commission of peace which creates confidence building among the Ethiopian peoples in order to alleviate the damages made by the previous regime. That it is, it builds confidence among the people. Third, there must be an economic formula. Majority of the youth in that country have no job. They are- mm. Unemployment is very high. Un yeah. un unemployment is very, very high, in, in 10 and 20 million. And so this must be given a hope that we are going to start a new project. We are going to start through the peace. Through this, will also peace will bring in economic development. What happened in the last two years, particularly, that the media, the media was not centralized to a certain extent. I'm not saying that the government has to control, but there was no also an ethical media which promotes the common goods rather than the common div division among the family. This was not there. And this is, I think, the task of the prime minister to create all this and to bring all the forces. Second, the prime minister should have been played as a captain of a football team in a transition before he goes to the election. But what happened is that there is a lot of footballers and a lot of teams developed and each one wants to score its own goals and it has left the population without a protection, ideological protection, psychological protection and so on and so on. Now, the Oromo issue is not only the, uh, the problem of, 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 of the prime minister alone. This is the problem of all the masses of the Oromo. The Oromos, they have the right to decide their own fate through discussion among themselves. As Professor Mercati say, Ethiopia's fate will be decided, are you in or out? That kind of discussion is, didn't happen. There was no discussion among the Oromos. I have never heard the debate which would which, which bring that Oromos will debate very deeply among themselves and they say, eh? here the Flemish debate among themselves. They didn't debate among themselves. There was no debate. And in the whole country for the last two years, there is no serious debate what is going to happen. The Oromo issue also concerns other nationalities. If the Oromos come to an agreement, we also have to study and discuss also 
with Oromos and others. Because the southern nationalities, to come back to the question. Yeah. All other nationalities, it concerns them. Mm. Because Let us focus now on the south, though, where the, the crisis south, is brewing there. It is growing, 57 nationalities. There are several nationalities in Ethiopia, particularly in the south, who want Kellen, who want it to be Kellen, and they say this is our right. And okay, let the, let the debate. There was no debate. For example, what uh, 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 Walaitas want, there was no debate. They say that it is, I hear rumor, Walaitas, they want kill them. But how they want kill them, in what basis, what is the argument of the intellectuals of the Walaita, and so on and so on, in an open, frank discussion, it didn't happen. Nobody knows. The Silte, they want kill them. Why? Who are the Sintes? Why they want Kellen? What kind of people they are? What is their culture? What is their language? What is their psychological? Mm -hmm. Nobody knows. The only I participated and I have seen, which I know Sidamas because of my background, that it is, I was there and they made their, their referendum, 98%. I was there. There was ambassadors from European Union and other places. They were monitoring it and it was perfectly. But there was no debate, no discussion. The media in that country, they don't explain. Media is supposed to play also an educative role, a debate role, and so on. There is media, is one accusing the other one, one accusing the other one. It is interviews there and there, but there is no debate. Secondly, so-called Ethiopian intellectuals, they cannot debate because it is, they were not given a chance to debate. Uh, there is no program of debating, uh, bringing Sidamas, bringing Walaitas, bringing this and this and bringing the others and debate. There are elements or there are forces who say we have to reverse all this killing and go back to the old system, which are a minority, that it is majority of the population. They don't want to have that because it's a lot of things was built. How do you change to where we will go? What kind of a system we have to build? There is no debate. Unfortunately, because there is no debate, there is a lot of ignorance. And the ignorance that the left rule continues. This is that I understand. So uh, the question though, Professor Mohammed, in the Southern region, there are 57 ethnic groups. Overall in Ethiopia, I think uh, it, the number of ethnic groups is 86, if I'm not mistaken, or uh, 80 something. So uh, with this concept uh, of uh, ethnic federalism, would it be okay then to have 86 uh, ethnic-based uh, regional states uh, within the, the federal state structure? First of all, uh, uh, the, the 86, they are bigger ones and a very smaller ones. Uh, the demand of the South now bigger ones about five or six. It's not a demand that came from the uh, uh, from the balloon. There was a study about it. In 1991, after the killer was declared, Sidamo was killed. Mm -hmm. On the basis of the studies before was made. So in order whether it will be killed or not, the issue is that first, the debate must have been very, very, very open and clear. And it could be an ed educational. It should not be based on I like Kellel or not Kellel. It's a democratic question. A man and woman can marry if they are in love. And if they disagree and they don't want to live, they can divorce. There is no problem. I will not uh, uh, agitate for divorce. I will agitate for reconciliation, maybe and somebody can agitate also for divorce. Maybe the other will say, no, divorce should be forbidden in the constitution. But the debate must be very open. This open debate among Ethiopians is very, very important to heal the past problems that they feel they are citizens in this country and they have a right and they can choose their future. That must be guaranteed first. Once psychologically that is guaranteed, the debate will be very, very honest and clearer way it will go. 
people are rational. They know their own interests. They know their own economic interests. They will not decide irrational. The issue is what is happening is the center is supposed to be the center for everybody, the center which accommodates everybody, the center which lets that it is the view of everybody comes on the table didn't happen. So there is suspicion from those in the periphery who are demanding their own kill or administration or zone and the center. The center answers only brutally for these questions. It doesn't debate with them. It knows only to use the force of the army. The army itself needs civil education. The army, the army, Ethiopian army is based and built for repression, is not built for democratization of the society. A society must be democratized, then the army must be also democratized and it must represent most of the Ethiopian people. This army, it had been a very brutal army, which has waged war inside Ethiopia, it waged war against its neighbor. So when I speak peace and democratization, all the institutions of Ethiopia must be democratized. I'm not saying in one day it will happen, but there must be the will, the will from the center, the will from the prime minister and decision makers that, that to start the, the, the process of democracy, the process of reconciliation, the process of building a new home. If they cannot do that and they fail, then the empire will be in crisis and it might collapse. Huh? Like any other empire, the characteristics of Abyss, uh, Ethiopia is not different from Austro-Hungary, from Austrian or the Habsburg Empire. The same characteristics. There is, you have 55% are Slavic people, which is the Czech, the Slovak, the Slovenians, the Croat, and so on, and so on. And then you have dominated by German group, huh? a little bit autonomous for Hungary. And this debate had existed for a very long time, but they could not solve it. And finally, it crumbled after the First World War. In 1918, different, different states came. The same with the Ottoman Empire. Huh? The fate of the Ottoman Empire also was decided by this contradiction. Sometimes nationalism can be irrational. Huh? When you take within the Ottoman Empire, the Greek and the Armenians, they were the most richest and dominating the whole Ottoman uh, market, but they demanded for independence. For small Greek and for poor Armenia. Now Armenia is poor. Huh? They were dominating the whole Ottoman Empire market. They were the most richest uh, people in, 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 in Istanbul. But they demanded for a small a uh, uh, market of them, and they became very poor, but sometimes nationalism is irrational. Wherever capitalist development grows in an empire, finally it will come. To solve this, you cannot solve it militarily. You can delay it militarily. You can kill people. You can arrest people and so on, so, but you cannot stop it. Okay, which brings us then to uh, the political actors. Uh, in Ethiopia right now, uh, I think there are well over 100 political parties. Now, are, are these really political parties? And uh, how many of them uh, are ethno-nationalists and how many are, uh, you know, multinational uh, uh, type of parties? Well, what kind of parties are, are we speaking about? In fact, in Ethiopia, there is no parties. How so? Uh, most of the parties are one person party. They cannot even pay their, uh, the rent of uh, their office. They are just a collection of petty bourgeoisie who have uh, uh, created name of a party. In, in a country like Ethiopia, a party needs an idea. It's not because uh, I want to create a liberal party, or whatever it is, and Mohammed can and, and, and have an office and I collect 50 people and run there and there, and we don't have, I, myself, I have difficulty of uh, uh, eating three times in a day uh, at home, and my children, and, and they only eat twice, and so, and so on. Do you think that there will be a party in a such country? No. Because everybody wants to be in the power. Because they knew that by having a power, they will also have a little bit more to eat. In Ethiopia, there is no political party, but there is sentiment. 
I don't see political parties, but there is sentiment. And sentiment is based, is an Oromo nationalist sentiment. Majority of the Oromo people, they embrace that. That is a very important sentiment. You have to entertain and deal with it. A very big sentiment that they believe they are Oromos, they believe they are oppressed, they believe that they are a very 40% of the population, they are the center of the country. If you are a political force and you are living there, you have to deal with this problem. If they have this sentiment that doesn't come from the sky, it has to be resolved. There is a sentiment of Somali nationalism. That is a fact. There is a sentiment. And the same with the Amhara, the same elsewhere, Amhara, with Tigray. With Amhara, and... With Tigray and so on. So this sentiment exists. And this is the result of the political history of the country. Can we accommodate that sentiment, rebuild on it? When we speak, this sentiment exists. This sentiment is in contradiction with peace. Not necessarily in contradiction with peace. This sentiment can be built eh, on the basis of to build a bigger. Second, the country should have, it didn't happen, a very long transitional period that they can discuss. How, how long? Uh... How long do you think it would be? Ten years. Okay. That they can know each other. That a caretaker prime minister of ten years, who is so democratic and genuine, and opens the window to everybody. Mm -hmm. First, reform the police. Reform ideologically. That the police is part of the people. It is part of the reform. The army must be reformed. The army should say, I only support the constitution, but I will not be involved in politics, and I'm not going, uh, if somebody order me go and shoot somebody, I will say no, I will not accept that. The debate must be, be the de in order to heal the previous historical mistakes happened in that country. Now almost they feel they are the betrayed, that they are they are frustrated, and this is forty percent of the population. The same sentiment though exists also within the Amhara. There are uh, their ethno nationalist forces which are saying the Oromo have now become uh, Terenya, the dominant uh, power, and uh, they are excluding us. That is correct. That is mm. the sentiment. That's why I say the. The transitional government must be able, uh, the country must be able to accommodate everybody. First of all, to close the concept of Tarenyanit, it is my time to eat. That must be removed. But all this can only happen not among the politicians. They are the common understanding for every, uh, for a poor and Amhara for the youth in Amhara, for Oromo, for Somali and so there is one thing is common among them. They want hope, they want job, they want to have family, they want to help their parents and so forth. So it has to be drafted an economic system which benefits the majority of the population. The majority of the population until now, they are outside of this debate. There is outside no of politics, you would say that? Totally outside of politics. They are not involved. With this is a very few people who are involved with on this. That is why Prof Professor Muslim, when he says that this country doesn't know politics, it only knows stick. In a sense, he is right. Because it's the majority of the people. There must be a mass mobilization. That it is the youth must know each other. They have to debate their own problem. It's not the problem of the elite or the so-called politician, but it is the youth must know each other and their future is at stake. There is no political party who have a vision and which unify all these forces, huh? that it is to one line, doesn't exist in that country. You have an ethno-nationalist oh. movement, and you have an extreme liberal who, who read their books from uh, Milton Friedman and so and so and so on, and import it and bring it to the country, which doesn't work and doesn't go with the real. Ethiopia is a country of peasant and pastoralist society. The urbanization grade is very small. The, uh, uh, the, the, the majority of Ethiopian people have no drinking water. 
majority of them don't have no electricity, they have no school, they have no health, and so and so. This huge majority is not involved in the politics and is not debating. But there is Oromo nationalist sentiment, even among the simple peasants, and have to be resolved. Oromos have to discuss, and as Merkaka said, are you in or out? And if you are in, in what contract you are going to be in? Mm -hmm. And of course, the big elephant in the room, so to speak, is the economy and uh, the economic uh, situation that uh, the, TP, the previous regime, the TPLF regime, uh, which looted and plundered uh, the country, uh, left it in severe crisis, in huge debt, is still there. Uh, how will Ethiopia manage to get out of this uh, deep economic uh, crisis? What, what is the way out? Well, I think, first of all, as I have said, in the beginning, there should have been a commission of truth, of embezzlement of the Ethiopian people property. That was not done. The criminals and those who are embezzled, they have no television, they control the region, and even they are feeling very strong and they are terrorizing the center. That was not done. Never in any country in the history that people who killed and looted and stole, they were exempted like this, except in Egypt. That's what happened. TPLF, with all their crimes, they were left alone. In Egypt, the Mubarak regime is supposed to have uh, looted, uh, I mean, Mubarak and his sons and his family, yes. uh, somewhere in the range of $70 billion, if not yes. more. Uh, how, how much do you think the, the TPLF, uh, what is your estimate of how much the TPLF uh, looted? $37 billion, they say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The country debt is in the 60s, and they say 60 billion or more. 64, they say, they have to pay about $2 billion only for the interest from these poor, poor people who have no water, who have no clinic, who have no school, who are their kids are living in masses and dying in the Red Sea, dying in, 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 in the desert of Sudan and Libya. Across, dying. But Ethiopia was being touted, uh, Professor Mohammed Hassan, uh, as uh, the fastest growing economy in Africa, 11% growth uh, by institutions such as the World Bank and the IMF. Uh, was, that, was all that fiction? Uh, fiction? Was there not some truth to it? There is no truth on it. That is, if Ethiopia was growing, the life of the population of Ethiopia would have been there. Mm, so they, they just, uh, they, they were trying to promote this neoliberal uh, uh, agenda in Africa as the way out? Yes, I think uh, they wanted to exploit Ethiopia's resources. And uh, they were, uh, uh, all this propaganda is for openness. And they used it in three pillars. One, Ethiopia became a very uh, a second uh, uh, exporting country of flowers at the expense of the ecology of Ethiopians, and those who are working flower are dying with, 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 with skin cancer, and uh, the chemicals will be used. This is Most of them are Oromo area, and some in Amhara area. Yeah, huh? yeah. And of course, now that uh, economy collapse. Second is, uh, Turkey is the biggest uh, investor in the country in textile. They only pay half, half an euro for girls, for men and women who are working there. And it is their yearly salary, according to the trade union here, they say it's 23 euro per month. So it's slave labor, it's a camp. A government who cannot protect its own population, it doesn't give even the minimum, the minimum they are supposed to have, doesn't treat them as a citizen. These are a collective of slaves. So there is no political leadership in a way and an organization based on the masses, at least analyzing the condition of the poorer people of the society. Ethiopia is a very poor country with the poor people, even though it has a lot of resources, but majority of the population is poor. So it's a contradiction. You can transform 
uh, there is no parties who are analyzing on that. And if you read uh, uh, the dogma now it exists is that it is everything for sale, that it is the attack progressive uh, uh, thinking, the attack uh, economies build uh, with consensus of the society, limiting the level of the market, they attack you, they say, no, no, this is had collapsed in the Soviet Union, had collapsed in Eastern Europe, but their idea is a neoliberal. The country doesn't produce a lot of things. They export tech. Ethiopia's export is more than it is, uh, uh, import is more than it is export. It always will be in a ba it is balance uh, uh, in deficit. Uh, the poverty it is, is increasing in a fastest rate. So sometimes you see that it is, this is also is manifested that it is the number of, of one group, huh? the Oromo area, it's a very big area, 300,000 square kilometer. It is the center. And of course, it is the, if the population is getting poorer and poorer, the first reflect will be it is nationalism, which is normal. We were, uh, we were exploited, we don't want, we wanted to use our resources for ourselves and so on. This we have seen it in a lot of European countries and European history. But do you really genuinely want to change the situation? Then needs a genuine solution and a serious solution. And I have the impression that I don't see serious people in that country. Uh, we're coming uh, to the end of our program. Unfortunately, the, the discussion, we, we need to continue this in the second part. But for now, uh, to sum up uh, in uh, two to three minutes, uh, what do you see as the current situation, the, the transition, and uh, the you know the delayed uh, election, which has been delayed due to the Corona COVID situation? Uh, peace and security is still uh, lacking in the country. Uh, there is a growing. Uh, an ease in stability. Uh, so, what does the future hold, or what is the way out, in, in your opinion? In my opinion, I advise Prime Minister Abi to develop uh, a, a three layer multiple diplomacy. One is to go back to the table and discuss with his brothers and sisters, Romos, and release the political prisoners, which is now almost 10,000, and have a very strong dialogue first with the Oromo political forces. And come to continue in the future, for, whether for election and, and dealing with other people, with other parts of Ethiopia, he has to do his homework. Secondly, I think it is, he should not, he should not uh, 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 attack the sentiment of Oromo people. The impression I have with the Oromos who are telling me that it is he's attacking the sentiment, the psychological sentiment of the Oromo people. If he wants to be a prime minister of that country, and one of them are the Oromos, and they feel very bad that it is he's attacking their sentiment and he's attacking their psychological makeup, that will bring a disaster to the country. I advise him it's better that it is he takes the bitter bill. And he says, no, life for an individual is very short. But people like Oromos and others will survive and they will live for a very long time. This is 40% of the population. It is the center of the country. Deal with them. You are an Oromo. Discuss with them. Come with a new formula. The same our Amhara brothers. I'm just telling them, please, that it is. If you love Ethiopia, then love Oromos. If you love Ethiopia and you want Ethiopia to continue, please try to understand the contradiction in the country in a very scientific way. The only Ethiopia which you love, it might disappear as any other empire has disappeared. But this time we need a very wise uh, thinking and we have to work very carefully. We should not play this uh, children play because it is situation is very 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 bad and finally that the country will collapse and will be split into pieces which i don't wish for that country and for the people of that country 
Nobody also will take care for us. It is ours who are responsible for what is going to happen there. It is, please use your wisdoms and think very wise and debate very honestly and, and bring proposals. If you have a proposal, bring it on the table. Let other people know that it is, uh, uh, if you want a unity, in what sense of unity? It's good. The unity, nobody uh, 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 dislike it. But please don't also, all of you, whether they are Oromos or Amharas or uh, uh, Southern people or Northern people, refrain from using negative words and uh, uh, which incites the people into a negative psychology, such kind of things that had brought the collapse of different empires I mentioned, and also such kind of thinking had brought the collapse of Yugoslavia. We have to be very, very careful. We are a multinational country. The region is a multinational region. And uh, I salute the Prime Minister for creating a peace situation between Turkey and Eritrea, but we have to build also peace in Turkey. Professor Mohammed Hassan, uh, thank you very much for your critical insight and uh, frank and open discussion. Uh, we will continue this discussion in part two, inshallah, uh, next week. Uh, there are issues that I want to discuss more, like the prosperity party, the ruling party, what is its situation, um, and other issues uh, that, that are evolving uh, right now. But for now, uh, due to time constraint, we will have to wrap it up here. Uh, dear viewers, thank you very much for uh, following this discussion, Horn of Africa TV. Please subscribe and uh, hit that notification button on YouTube and share widely. Until next time, goodbye.